All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to PyTorch Summer Hack 2020. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone, give everyone um, you know, some updates, uh, and, and just convey my excitement for everyone to you know, be part of this um, and, and participate in the, in the Summer Hack. Um, so again, I'm Joe Spizak. I'm the uh, product manager for PyTorch here at Facebook. Um, and this is, this is exactly what I love to do. This is, this is all about building community and, and bringing people together to, to hack and, and create amazing things. Um, so the PyTorch Summer Hack 2020, uh, we're partnering again with DevPost, um, which is super awesome. Those guys did a great job um, last year. Um, and, you know, this is an online competition. So again, sorry, we couldn't do this in person this year um, with COVID, but hopefully we can get, get back together next year and do it in, in Menlo Park or somewhere, somewhere else. Um, but the cool thing about an online competition is you get more time. Um, and so you can see here that the deadline is August 25th. Um, 2020 at 5 p.m. So it gives you a little more time to, to kind of uh, to, to put something together uh, really amazing um, and work more, um, you know, with the, with the community. Um, so, you know, again, this is like, this is, this is like pure bliss for me as, as, as someone who loves to build community around AI and open source. Um, but really the motivations for, for these hackathons, besides them just being super cool to do, is, is really to build community and bring the community together. Uh, last year we saw, um, you know, there were folks that were, were building educational tools. Um, there were, uh, there was a team that was uh, searching for, you know, exoplanets. Um, there was a team that was, um, you know, uh, building uh, again, you know, generated t-shirts. Uh, there were such a diversity of, of, uh, of attendees, um, um, experts in different fields, and people were coming together and building something really cool. Um, and that co goes to like learning from the best. There's, there's going to be researchers at, you know, from different universities here. There's going to be experts in, in different fields. Um, there's going to be the PyTorch core team that's going to participate um, and a lot of others. So there's really an opportunity to learn from people um, from, from different vantage points um, and that, that are experts in a lot of different areas. And of course, the goal of any hackathon is to build something amazing, something just, you know, something really cool, something that's, um, that, you know, you can basically start with a clean sheet um, be really, um, you know, uh, you know, really open-ended and, and kind of express any idea or any, any cool, cool thing you're thinking about. This is the place to be creative and, and, and do something amazing. Um, so this year we actually have three categories that we're, we're targeting for the hackathon. One is uh, PyTorch developer tools. And this, you know, it, it can be a lot of different things. Um, last year, uh, you know, Michaela Pagnini, um, who is over in, in FAIR as a researcher, created you know, the, the torch.prune um, utility, which prunes um, neural networks in PyTorch. Um, but it could be a lot of other things, but, you know, think about um, developer efficiency and, and, and building something um, that, that really helps developers be more productive. The second category is this web mobile applications powered by PyTorch. So this could be more of an application level um, submission. Again, last year, somebody did um, a really cool t-shirt generation um, uh, service actually using GANs. Um, and then lastly, the responsible AI and development tools. So um, think about fairness, bias, interpretability. Um, this is not only like a hot area of research and, and a hot area, it's, it's, it's something that actually can have real societal impact. Um, how do we think about fairness? How do we think about bias in AI systems? Um, it's actually something that is, uh, it's a very, very important topic and something that um, we should all be thinking about and, and building tools here can really have impact. Um, um, within society itself. So let's take a step back and just give everyone a little bit of background on PyTorch itself. Um, again, I, I, I've been with the project for about two and a half years. Um, and so it's, it's a project that's near and dear to my heart and, and has a really amazing community around it. And it is, of course, an open source project. So we are open source first. Um, we have now over 1,400 contributors um, and really active. Uh, we put out regular releases. Um, roughly a quarterly um, with maintenance releases in between. We are permissively licensed um, and used by uh, you know, pretty much any, anyone from big industry labs to uh, independent developers to uh, anyone just trying to pick up machine learning. Um, but what, you know, how do we think about PyTorch? Like what are some of the, the kind of core ideas or, or tenants that we think about when, when we are building it? You know, number one, uh, we think about eager and graph mode. So eager mode being this Pythonic, if I can learn Python, if I can know how to write Python, 
um, I basically be, can be able to write PyTorch, which has made it really easy for people to pick up. Um, but we also need to, to think about graph mode execution when you know, we want to be able to ship models in, in any kind of like large scale production. Um, we need to be able to, to get to a static graph that can be then executed on maybe billions or millions of, of, of times at some level of efficiency. Um, second, the dynamism of, of PyTorch is important because this is where cutting edge research is. This is things like variable like data. Uh, data. This is things like um, control flow uh, within models. Um, so that's really important and actually, especially in, in areas like NLP where we're seeing this, this really this, um, this uh, explosion of different types of architectures, um, especially over the last year to two years. Um, and if you've been following those transformer architectures, you know that these are very large models uh, in the billions um, uh, of parameters, um, sometimes over 100 billion. If you look at, uh, for example, GPT-3 at 175 billion, which manifests itself into a very large size. So, you know, gigabytes or even, even into the terabyte range. So distributed training becomes very important because we need to partition the model um, either in data parallel and model parallel um, ways uh, to be able to train it efficiently. Uh, fourthly, hardware acceleration. Uh, we've seen a number of startups. We've seen Habana. We've seen, obviously, NVIDIA with uh, the GPUs. Um, and we've seen a, a host, whole host of others like cloud TPUs with Google. And so hardware acceleration is important um, because time to solution for researchers is an important problem um, and to be able to, uh, to improve their efficiency and, and productivity. And lastly, from an API perspective, um, we value simplicity over complexity. Uh, we do uh, value hackability uh, of our API, so we're not going to uh, be, you know, providing a lot of black boxes. But we do um, think about the like the user experience a lot when we put an API um, out there on the front end. And when you take a big step back in PyTorch, um, kind of everything that we we think about ladders up to this one single focus goal, and that's really this research prototyping to production deployment. How can I basically uh, allow researchers to express essentially any idea or any algorithm, but then have a path to, to production deployment um, and, and not have to go through a lot of pain on the way to getting there? Um, so that's basically how we think about the project um, and, and really our overarching mission. Um, when we double click down into PyTorch though, it's, it's not this monolithic, monolithic thing. It's, it's, it is basically a number of APIs and libraries. So uh, if you look at, for, for example, how we model a, a layer um, using the Torch NN um, you know, module API uh, or Torch data, which allows you to basically load data sets or um, batch um, to do you know, data loading um, or down to, to like libraries like Torch Vision, uh, which provides you basically these you know, kind of ready-made you know, models, uh, transforms for things like data augmentation or even just loading a data set like ImageNet. So let's take a look at the PyTorch community um, for a second, because this is, again, where I get super excited. Um, this, this community is really made up of a lot of passionate individuals. Um, they come from uh, academia. They come from their independent developers. They could be startups. Um, they could be uh, applied labs, um, say, like uh, Dolby or Tesla, um, Salesforce, uh, or folks like Jeremy Howard, who are just, just absolutely passionate about building community and, and democratizing um, the you know, AI education. Um, so it's, an, it's a really incredible community. Um, another, as, another view on the, the community is, is, you know, from research. Like if you look at some of the, the publications that O'Reilly put out, um, you know, they, they've seen just uh, independently, they published this around just how much, you know, researchers love it and how much they're using it. Um, and then of course, big players in, in the space, like Preferred Networks, who is big in Japan um, and, uh, and is now, um, you know, standardized and, and and part of the PyTorch community. They were the, they were the folks behind Chainer, if, if, if you know. And they've also uh, made a huge impact in the short, short time that they've joined the community. They put out new libraries um, and uh, they've contributed to PyTorch. And then lastly, OpenAI. So I think everyone knows OpenAI. They, they do some of the most impactful uh, research in the space. Um, they've standardized on PyTorch, which is really exciting. And they've always been um, communicating and, 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 and working uh, with the PyTorch community, but now they, they really standardize in their um, they're working on a number of different areas, um, large scale training, um, interpretability, um, et cetera. So when we look at the numbers, again, over 1400 contributors to the project, that's a growth year over year of over 50%. And we're approaching around, I think over 30,000 now, PyTorch form users. So, you know, it's not just a handful of users or, or maintainers that answer questions. 
um, it really is this, this community that can help you um, learn, answer questions, uh, engage, build things together. Um, another view on the metrics, uh, if anybody hasn't gone to paperswithcode.com, um, it's a really great resource. If you ever want to know what the state of the art is in, in practically anything, um, you'll find it on Papers with Code. Uh, if you want to find out, for example, um, you know, what model architecture is the state of the art in object detection, um, it will tell you, and it will tell you over time how progress has been made. And not only that, it will actually tell you, um, you know, it'll actually link uh, papers um, that you can read as well as the code, as well as models and other artifacts all wrapped up in this amazing community that kind of feels like Wikipedia where anyone can edit, um, anyone can basically engage and, and be part of it. And you can see from the red there, uh, PyTorch has done quite well over the, like, the last couple of years, uh, which is really exciting. So we're honored that people are building the research on PyTorch. So let's talk about the latest. So um, again, we do releases um, for PyTorch around uh, once a quarter, so every, every three months, uh, with some uh, maintenance releases typically in between. So PyTorch 1.5, or actually 1.51, is, is really the, the latest release. 1.5.1 was a maintenance release uh, that just had some, some bug fixes and minor improvements, no real features. Um, so 1.5 had a, a lot of improvements that came out on April 21st, over 2,200 commitments, so it was a big release. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of code came out um, in that release, and a lot of really impactful features came. Um, so Torch Serve, so one of the, the top things that we, we heard from the community over the last year was we need a model serving solution for PyTorch. So we partnered last year with Amazon and built Torch Serve, and this has been a really great project. It's an experimental now, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's growing very quickly and, and will be integrated, for example, with MLflow um, and Kubeflow uh, slash KF Serving. Um, so it should be able to basically, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty effortlessly uh, ship models uh, with Torch Serve um, on any of those kind of lifecycle management, uh, model management platforms. Um, the second thing is Kubernetes support for Torch Elastic. So uh, if you think about Elastic fault tolerant um, training, uh, that's what Torch Elastic brings. Uh, if I want to, for example, dynamically scale my resources up or down, um, but also be um, kind of immune to those uh, the fault tolerance of uh, things like preemptible or spot instances, for example, if you're on AWS. Um, we actually built a, a controller, or, or more specifically, Amazon built a Kubernetes um, you know, controller with, uh, with Torch Elastic, and that's in, in, in open source in the Torch Elastic repo. Um, thirdly, um, we stabilized our model parallel training. Um, so this is important again for like large models when you start to get into these models that, that won't fit on a single, uh, even a single machine. And you wanna actually be able to split the model itself uh, across maybe GPUs or, or even CPUs. Um, fourthly, uh, we brought on a new suite of, of Autograd APIs um, that basically supports uh, kind of advanced features like Jacobian's, Hessian's, Jacobian vector products, vector Jacobian products, you get the idea. Um, and those are added to uh, torch.autograd.functional. So you can check those out. Those are um, uh, currently uh, experimental or, or what we're calling beta going forward. Um, we've also stabilized um, the C++ front end API. And what that means is that it essentially is, is a parity with Python and it actually looks and feels like Python. So if you've ever used the C++ front end for PyTorch, um, uh, you'd know this. If you haven't, check it out. Um, if you don't know C++, uh, using our API, you might learn C++ pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, the last feature is really be able to, to create these kind of custom C++ um, you know, classes um, uh, in, uh, in TorchScript. And then um, the, the nice thing about this release is Python 2 also is, is no longer um, part of the release. We deprecated Python 2. It's no longer supported. You can always go get the older releases, but with this release, we we are 100% Python 3. Um, along with the core releases, we also typically release a, a set of domain libraries. Um, so these are really great, again, for uh, things like uh, different modalities, so vision, text, and audio. Um, and I won't go through the, the details here, but you can check these out. Um, Torch Vision is, is an incredibly popular project, tens of thousands of downstream projects uh, depend on it, provides cutting edge, uh, transforms models, data sets, uh, torch text especially uh, as well, um, is great for like NLP translation. So if you want it, for example, loaded a uh, common data set, like for example, IMDB um, and so on, or, or load a, a state of the art model um, that's available. And then torch audio uh, for things like uh, ASR, uh, so automatic speech recognition, 
um, or audio recognition um, provides a number of, of building blocks and, and transforms and other things um, to support research and, and development in that space. So getting started, I think everyone's aware that we have PyTorch.org, really great site managed by um, some great people on our team and, and contributed uh, by, uh, you know, to the community around tutorials, docs, uh, blogs, um, et cetera. And you can basically go to that, go to the site there. You can start locally, you just do your selector, your platform, which version. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy to get started either on, on locally or via cloud partners. We support AWS. Um, Azure, Google, as well as uh, Ali Cloud. And we also support mobile, and we have binaries on uh, JCenter as well as CocoaPods. Um, and then we have a whole uh, set of educational resources. So if anyone hasn't gone to Udacity, pretty much every Udacity course uh, just about, uh, I think is on PyTorch. There's quite a bit uh, of other frameworks as well, but um, there's quite a bit of Py PyTorch content, including some free intro um, to deep learning courses, as well as uh, the the private AI course that we released last year. Um, so we definitely check these out. Uh, there are books and there's more books coming and more and more books coming actually. Uh, but here's a couple of, of great examples. Uh, there is the Natural Language Processing with PyTorch by Dilip Rao, uh, as well as uh, Eli and Luca's uh, Deep Learning with PyTorch book. And they're both really great resources. And of course, uh, Jeremy Howard's book uh, gets uh, released very soon, uh, his latest. I would definitely check that one out too. Um, and then um, I mentioned uh, Fast.ai. I would check out um, you know, Fast.ai's site. There's a lot of great learning there as well. Uh, they provide their, their library on top of PyTorch, um, as well as a number of like free MOOCs um, that you can basically, you don't need to sign up. You can watch the videos, the code's available, everything's fully available. Uh, and Jeremy and, and the team do such an amazing job of building community literally globally um, around PyTorch, which is really awesome. Um, and then internationally, we also have, we have really passionate folks in both China and Korea, uh, and we hope to grow into other, other areas as well. Uh, you can go to pytorch.apachecn.org and you can see basically our, our docs and tutorials um, in uh, Chinese translation um, uh, by the team there, um, as well as in Korea. And uh, the, the folks in Korea have done an amazing uh, 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 tutorials.pytorch.kr uh, they've done a really amazing job of, of translating um, basically the entire site um, uh, up, up into the latest release. Um, and uh, so I would definitely check that out if you're, if you're looking to, to read native Korean language. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have a community on Twitter, we have a community on YouTube, and our medium.com uh, blog managed by uh, Mr. Woo Kim is absolutely incredible. There's been, I think, nearly 40 blogs in the last couple of months, by the, mostly by the community. I think pretty much all by the community um, and they've gotten great engagement and there's some uh, incredible uh, uh, new projects, new libraries uh, within the PyTorch ecosystem. There's tutorials. Um, there, there's just a lot, lot there to read. So I would definitely check that out. Thank you very much and enjoy the hackathon. Cheers.